Good evening. Welcome to this uh, joint meeting of the Local Agency Formation Commission, the Aptos La Selva Fire Protection District, and the Central Fire Protection District. Um, we need to uh, start with a... We will start with a roll call of the three bodies. Uh, good evening, Mr. McCormick. Good evening. I'm Pat McCormick. I'm the LAFCO Executive Officer. Calling roll call for LAFCO. Commissioner Jim Anderson. Here. Commissioner Roger Anderson. Here. Commissioner Friend. Here. Commissioner Hurst. Here. Commissioner LaHue. Here. Commissioner Tarasas. Here. Chair Leopold. Here. So we have the roll call for the Aptos La Selva Fire Protection District. Good evening. Aaron Love, Fire Chief, Aptos La Selva Fire Protection District. Roll call for the Board of Directors. Director Abishan, absent. Director Hurley, here. Director Lucchese, here. Director Spizak, here. Board President Foster, here. Could we have the roll call for the Central Fire Protection District? Good evening, Steve Hall, Fire Chief of the Central Fire District of Santa Cruz County. Director Burnham. Here. Director Couples. Here. Director Frankie. Here. Director Haas. Here. Director Lucchese. Here. Director Walter. Here. And Chair Miller. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you could all rise and we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, thank you to everyone for coming out uh, tonight. Uh, I want to let you know, uh, if you didn't already know, that if you're parked outside, parking is free here at Cabrillo after 5 o'clock. So you don't have to worry about over-parking or uh, having to uh, get a new tag um, before the end of the evening. There are also handouts of the PowerPoint and the executive summary of the report that are in the back of the room and outside. If you haven't had a chance uh, um, to see it or if you want to get a copy of what you see uh, here this evening. We will open tonight's uh, meeting with oral communications. If there are items under the purview of the Local Agency Formation Commission or one of these two fire districts, uh, please come forward, and, but it's now on tonight's agenda, please come forward and we'll give you up to three minutes to, uh, to make some oral communication. Is there anyone who would like to make oral communication to, the, to these boards? Well, seeing none, um, let me just tell you about why we're here tonight. Um, the purpose uh, uh, tonight is uh, to review the Mid-County Fire Agency's con Consolidation Feasibility Study and Service Review. The Local Agency Formation Commission is uh, a commission uh, uh, that is, there's a LAFCO in every county, uh, and they were formed in 1963 uh, to deal with uh, growth in California. We work on preventing urban sprawl, protecting prime ag land, and we work for the orderly uh, and efficient services of governments, which is, think of it as a boundary uh, setting commission. Um, we are required by state law to do municipal service review of uh, the county, the cities, uh, special districts. Uh, we do that every five years, um, and we regularly look at, at special studies and areas where we might be able to help improve the efficiency of services. We also set up sphere of influences, which determine where uh, different special districts or cities might be able to grow. Uh, so people can have some expectation of where that's gonna grow, and rather than happening um, uh, haphazardly. Uh, that's worked pretty well for 55 years. Um, tonight we are here because uh, these three organizations have decided to take a look at the fire services in the mid-county uh, to determine whether we could uh, provide, what these services could be provided in another way that would be more efficient and more effective for the community. We'll hear a lot more about that. Uh, I wanna ask uh, Joe Foster, who is the chair of the Aptos and Selva Fire District, 
if he wants to say anything about the fire district. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, again, Joe Foster, president of the board of the Aptos of Silver Fire District. I, I see a lot of familiar faces out there tonight and uh, a lot of new faces too. So on behalf of the Aptos La Silva Fire Protection District, thank you for your engagement in this issue and coming out tonight to hear the presentation uh, about the study and to engage in this topic, uh, one that's been thoroughly looked at up to this point and we know we're still sort of in the preliminary stages and looking at the findings of the report and uh, how things will go going forward. So uh, for those of you who don't know, the, the Aptos and Selva Fire District is a three station district serving the beautiful communities of Aptos and La Selva. We have uh, a lot of our uh, firefighters here tonight and thank you for being here as well. And um, we have three other board members here as well and one that's absent. But, uh, we're very pleased to be here, and I'll hand it over back over to Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Mr. Foster. And now I'll turn to Owen Miller, if he wants to say a few words about the Central Fire Protection District. Sure, thank you. Um, I guess I don't get a mic up. I'll stand at this one. Anyway, uh, I am Owen Miller. I'm the board chair for Central Fire Protection District, for which is Live Oak, SoCal, and Capitola, um, with the result of a merger of three districts um, in 1987. On behalf of the board, I'd like to welcome you here tonight. Uh, again, I'd like to echo the same sentiments that we want to hear from you. Where are your representatives? Um, this is a consolidation study um, that you just heard is in its preliminary uh, findings, if you will. But we look forward to what you have to say once you hear what the study is presented for you. Um, as board of directors, we're looking forward to the information that's being presented tonight and uh, see what the future holds for both our districts on a possible consolidation. Again, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Miller. Uh, the, uh, our Santa Cruz LAFCO has looked at uh, fire services throughout the years. In addition, there have been grand jury reports and other reports looking at consolidation of services or mergers. Um, last year, when, the, when LAFCO looked at the municipal service review for our fire districts, the, uh, uh, the fire district asked us to do a more in-depth study. Uh, working together with both fire districts and members of our local LAFCO, we, uh, we uh, scoped out what a study would look like, and each of our three agencies have contributed equally uh, to the creation of this study. Um, tonight is an information to share information about what's in that study and to ask questions. We will not be taking action on this study tonight, save for one thing. The, uh, our local LAFCO will, uh, at the end of this meeting, I will see whether they want to accept this study. Um, and, but then each of the fire districts will be taking it back to their um, uh, boards. We'll be talking about it some more. Um, and depending on where people want to go with this, it, will, uh, it could lead uh, to more actions at our local LAFCO. Um, but we haven't predetermined. Uh, this study uh, is, uh, is very thorough. It's about 200 pages. It's available on each of our agencies' websites, uh, and I encourage you to take a look at it. It is a good read. Um, uh, there is a variety of recommendations, and each of the fire districts will uh, determine what they want to take with those uh, 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 recommendations and implement them over both the short and long term. So now I will turn it over to our consultants um, who, will, who will make a presentation. I should warn people this is a long presentation because we consider this a serious subject. Um, and uh, as a result, I want to uh, ask my colleagues to join me in stepping off the stage and sitting in the front row so we can actually see the presentation. Um, uh, and then afterwards, there will be questions uh, from members of the commission and the two districts, and then we will turn it over to members of the public to ask questions. There will be microphones down there, and I'll, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that when the time comes. Um, but uh, please join me in welcoming our consultants, uh, and they'll set up and we'll move down there.
Good evening, my name is Dawn Middleman, and I am project manager and senior associate for Emergency Services Consulting. Um, and once again, I would like to reiterate what has been expressed here about appreciation to all of you folks for being here, coming out on a Monday night, and, and being your interest in this. Uh, as um, I'm going to introduce a little bit about our team, just so you know our experience level. Uh, my experience, my specialty is LAFCO. Uh, I have over 30 years experience uh, with LAFCO, and I'm one of the few folks in the state who has been both a commissioner and an executive officer of LAFCO. Um, in addition, I have been president of a board of fire protection district for 12 years. Uh, and in that capacity, we were one of the first to join a fire district with a fire department that has been extremely successful and is now in its 14th year. Um, my other uh, close associate here is Kurt Latipow. He is also a senior associate with the SCI. He has over 40 years experience in fire service with 27 of those years uh, specifically as a fire chief. This is important that he has been a fire chief of both fire departments and fire districts because anyone that's involved with fire districts knows that it's quite a different process than uh, a fire department which has a full range of city services available whereas a fire district uh, they have to handle all of those services, whether it's HR, finance, whatever it is. Uh, we also, there was, this is a complicated project specifically with respect to the finances. So what we did is we brought in uh, a couple of different experts on the team. Uh, Randy Parr is both a CPA and a fire chief. So he was our go-to person for financial analysis. Then with respect to the um, benefits and the packages and so on and so forth, we brought in an actuarial firm, and that is Bickmore Actuarial Firm. And their report is attached to the back of our report, and of course, we used that extensively as I, we went through our analysis. I would like to express appreciation to Santa Cruz LAFCO, uh, to Aptos La Silva Fire Protection District, and to Central Fire Protection District. Uh, everyone we've dealt with has been extremely helpful in getting us information very quickly and whatever we might need, so we really, really do appreciate all that help and support. All right, so the purpose of the study, as mentioned a bit earlier, was to study the consolidating of, of the two fire districts and to conduct a service review and sphere of influence update uh, for the fire district. Our deliverables were to develop two staffing models uh, for a consolidated district and a description of operational improvements or reductions. Um, also, to develop budgets for those two staffing models of a consolidated district. To look at salary and benefit levels uh, of the anticipated budget, and to also look at current and post, current pension and post-employment benefits and liabilities of the districts. There again, that's that deep dive into the financials, and that's where the actuarial firm was extremely important. Uh, we also were requested to look at the governance structure for a consolidated district for the boards, uh, and then to close with challenges, opportunities, weaknesses, and strengths. Good evening. I was just checking because up here we can hear a little bit of feedback, and I want to make sure that it, that's, that you're not getting feedback out there. Pre-final study review. This has been a very long process, as has been mentioned already. It's a lot of pages, so I'm going to start on page one. <laughs> 
Um, on July 11th, we participated uh, in facilitating a meeting with the steering group that's been with this project since its inception, uh, before it was even decided to carry it out. The interaction during this meeting, the feedback, was extremely informative for us as we moved towards the final uh, document. At that meeting, before we, before we recessed the meeting and moved into our final production, we made it very clear that we were not going to be able to bring our CPA to this meeting tonight. He's actually back at the National Fire Academy participating in the development of the program. So we asked that in the event there was any concerns with some of the projections that, that we went through in a two and a half hour meeting, to please forward that information to us along with the backup necessary to do the review before we did the final. When nothing was submitted, we moved on to the final production. Tonight's presentation will be a fairly high flight because I didn't think you all wanted to be here for three or four hours. Organizational overview, we've already heard a little bit out about this. Many of you in the audience are already familiar with the overview of these organizations. However, as we moved into the study, it was important for us to look at both organizations, first individuals, and this is the history. And as you look at the history of both these districts, what's, what jumps out at us, <clears throat> at least from the layperson, from the outside looking in, is both districts have a history of consolidation. Both districts cover an area very similar. Both districts protect uh, a fair amount of assessed valuation. So Aptos is up there on the screen. Aptos stand alone. You already, those of you who are here from the district, the board members, the responders in the audience, these are the boundaries, as was already mentioned, the three stations. Central Fire, somewhat similar, square miles, more population, it's got, you know, a little bit more assessed valuation. Service levels are very similar. All risk, both agencies are all risk plus. And then that's the layout of Central. So now as we transition, and as we as the folks assigned to the team to look at this possible consolidation, as we transition, we get up a little bit in elevation and we start to look at and start running models and start doing analysis as if it were one. Both districts had already gone through a standard of coverage and uh, an administrative and master plan type of document with another consulting firm it was not our intent to duplicate that work, but to merely reference it and, when necessary, <coughs> redo some of the data. So, as I said, we step back a couple of steps, we get a little higher in altitude, and as you can see, this is the layout of these two districts side by side <coughs> as the organizational overview of where all the stations are at and the areas that they cover. Not only did we look at the areas uh, that they covered, not only did we look at the risks, the hazards, the call lines, etc., but we also looked at the facilities and apparatus. Uh, we spent several days on site, and I'll talk about interviews in a little bit, but we also, my wife and I, who are a team with the SCI, spent time in both districts walking through facilities. And that's kind of a fuzzy picture, pic, picture of Aptos along with some of the apparatus. So as you'll see, you know, you already know there's three stations. The stations are in generally good condition. Could they be configured a little differently? Uh, yes, absolutely, as all stations that were built a few years ago could be. Aptos, the silver station, range in age from 40 to 50 years old. Uh, as I referenced, CityGate had already done a couple of studies. Uh, CityGate's recommendation was to look uh, to relocating Station 3, which is down near the beach. That was a great station to visit, by the way, um, and possibly bring it up a little closer to the highway. Central Fire, five facilities, ranging in age from 18 to 60, 63 years. Several have been updated and remodeled. One and two, in our opinion, in a non-engineered opinion, will continue to serve the department well into the future. Three and four are aging. They're in designated floodplains. This was also called out in the CityGate report. 
The Citygate report mentioned potentially relocating those stations in the future. Uh, due to the fact, from our, our perspective, access is tough, egress is tough, it's always impaired by uh, congestion. They're marginally adequate for use in the future. In our opinion, uh, consideration should be given to relocating those and possibly consolidating. Consulting. We looked at staffing. We spent a lot of time looking at staffing, looking at numbers. I took a, a walk through the CityGate report in both of these areas. But not only did I take a walk through the CityGate report, but I also interviewed the, the Chief of Central and the Interim Chief of Aptos at the time. And as Don mentioned, uh, I do have experience in running fire districts. My wife has extreme, extreme amount of experience in administration and consolidations. So not only did we look at the CityGate report, not only did we interview the chiefs, but we also uh, relied somewhat on our own experience of what it takes to run a fire district. Which is, for those of you in the audience, a fire district is a lot different than a city fire department. In, in essence, a fire district is a city. All those functions that the folks who are here from the cities rely on those different departments, it all falls on the chief to make sure those are taken care of. Aptos is still the admin support, it's up there on the wall for you. One chief, one director of business services, two admins, a part-time point two that's actually uh, shared with uh, central, three divisions, and then an EMS shared chief, which is not included in the response uh, algorithm. So then we move on over to Central. Central has a vacancy in their assistant chief, and these are all the positions that Central has, as you can see, a little more robust admin administration. Now we move over to the response side, and both departments, some of their admin folks also act as responders. So when you see those numbers roll up, some of them are double counted. So Aptos uh, has all these folks in the, re the response algorithm, uh, just like Central, or similar to Central, uh, the fire apparatus operator position, everybody on the job uh, is, is qualified for the most part to operate apparatus. Central, very similar, a few more bodies, a few more FTEs, if you will, four battalions, 13 captains, 33 apparatus operators, no real firefighters, every firefighter on the job uh, is expected to operate. And then a little different than Aptos, uh, Central also utilizes paid call firefighters to augment their staff, to augment their full-time folks. So broken down individually, remember I said sometimes the, ad, the uh, line personnel, personnel gets double counted because admin responds with the line. So there's your breakdown for each of them. Individually, not real big organizations. But let's look at what happens when you combine those numbers. Combine, combine the two organizations make up for a pretty sizable force. However, as you can see in the admin support area, it, it does need a little, a little more review. Uh, and, and we did a pretty deep dive in the report. So the other, uh, another area of the study, we took a look at how the organization staff, how they respond, um, and really they're very similar in the way they operate. They're 24 hour shifts, 48 hours at a time. Um, the personnel rotate through those shifts. They work with three, what's called the three platoon system, ABC. Uh, the only difference really is um, uh, uh, Central has a paid call program and Aptos does not. Then we look at what's called, what are, uh, we look at critical tasks, we look at uh, alarm assignments, we look at, with the input from the districts, what it takes in each position to fill every task and every alarm. And then we make a determination whether or not, uh, in our opinion, it's adequate. In looking at the, the critical tasking and the alarm assignments that the district staff furnishes, 
it's our opinion that neither district can, can field a full first alarm without assistance from automatic or mutual aid. This is, this is a no-brainer, this next statement. Aptos La Silva does not have a, a truck company. They must depend on Central's cross-staff truck being available in the event they need a truck company. Service demand delivery and performance. One of the reasons we look at service demand delivery and performance is we're seeing how busy the system is. We're seeing how busy each unit is. We're looking at how many times units are committed to multiple calls. So service demand delivery and performance, you can see right there, the two districts side by side, blue is Aptos La Silva, the golden, I don't know what it looks like for the audience, it looks golden up from up here. Uh, uh, it's a little busier system, but it shows you how things have escalated over the years. It's interesting when you take a look at the dips, the dips, what we typically see, and I believe what we've seen here with Central, uh, and to some degree with Aptos, for whatever reason, the dips follow, follow the recessionary track. So we look at service demand, we look at delivery, we look at station location, and then we look at call concentration. So, you know, and, and again, as you drive through the districts, this really isn't that surprising, and the crews will tell you this isn't that surprising. They know where their hot spots are, they know where their concentrations are. This, is, this doesn't say, it does not indicate that there's no calls going on anywhere else. All it, said, all it indicates is per square mile, these are some of the busier areas. And this will be interesting when I show you some other recommendations later in the slide. So then we move into station coverage in the event we're a consolidated district. And you'll see all, the only times that are on this slide are fours and eights. When you get into the study, there's many more maps and colors. However, we look to see um, what the footprint would look like from a response perspective in the event the organization was functioning as one. And you can see that really uh, there's a significant amount of the district can be accessed within four minutes absent traffic. Yeah. Um, now, again, it was not our task to duplicate the CityGate report. The CityGate report, both of them, have a significant amount of information on traffic. I did ask our GIS analysis to take a look at what CityGate had done in that area, and she concurred. So you're looking at the footprint for four and, eight, four and eight minutes. You can see station three down there. That, that is where uh, CityGate recommended bumping it up closer to Highway 1. Another section of the report is response reliability. Why do we look at response reliability? We're looking to see if, you know, how busy the system is. Uh, the next figure I'm going to show you, we're going to talk about concurrent incidents for each agency. And it's, it was very interesting. When we walked through this um, the more in-depth two and a half hour program uh, with the steering group, we spent a fair amount of time discussing how, how busy the two systems are and some of the overlaps. More calls that are occurring at the same time results in a lack of availability of units. So, what, is this, what does this slide tell us? This is 2017 data. We redid a fair amount of the response data because CityGate's data was based up to 2016, and we made a commitment <coughs> to our clients, all three boards, <coughs> that where appropriate, we would try to get real-time and fresh data. Uh, so we did. So almost everything we've got is based on 2017. So what does concurrent calls mean? So in 2017, 755 times, Aptos is still in the Fire Protection District had two calls running at once. Central, a little busier system, okay? 
three times, 200, three, three time, 260 times, Aptos of Silva had three calls working at once. Central Fire, 577 times. Now we're starting to get to the number of stations that the districts have. So now, 87 times for Aptos of Silva, four calls one at once. 226 times for Central. And I, and I could go all over down the list, but the bottom line is these two districts are codependent because the number of calls that are running and how many concurrent calls they have. And it's only going to get better. So, uh, based on the incident provided from both departments, uh, we projected a 5% increase in calls through 2028. And our baseline was 2017. When we reviewed the CityGate study, the numbers are the same, the percentage is the same. I did not, I did not have our GIS analysis look at the CityGate study until she ran some of this information for, for us. So that's how good it's going to get through 2028. You're going to have an extremely busy system and uh, more and more concurrency of calls. So get ready for it, it's coming. So we looked at response, we looked at stations, we, we looked at apparatus, and there's notes in there for the, with the apparatus. One thing I want to make clear, we looked at a snapshot in time. This study has been going on for seven or eight months due to the complexity, so things have changed. I know for a fact Central has ordered apparatus. Aptos has ordered apparatus. Um, so when you look at the study, you go, oh, well, that's wrong. I know they, they got new stuff coming. Yeah, but we looked at what was on the deck at the time we were there. So when we, and, and I don't want to belabor this too long, but we believe, and almost every single one of our studies, regardless of the type of study it is, has a big stakeholder interview piece in it. We were on site for three solid days, working through lunch, interviewing board members, business, community members, labor members, chief officers, and you'll see in the report there's an extensive section on stakeholder input. I just tried to hit the common threads for the purpose of the presentation. So the common threads are up there. I've got a couple of slides. Uh, and a majority of the stakeholder input was positive. Both districts currently share resources, including the truck, when it's available. Good services, adequate response times. And I'm reading these because I think it's important to celebrate them. The district provides good service, adequate response. They're progressive, provide fire medical. Many believe the two districts have been moving in a positive direction. We also reviewed the history before we came in to the area to do these interviews. Many believe the two districts have moved in a positive direction and, then, and the public has been giving you positive comments. From the stakeholders. Potential opportunities to enhance service. Italian chief, division chief, chief oversight could be improved in the event they were one. Now, I do know that as we were rolling through trying to get the study done, there's currently a pilot program in place that pretty much is sharing chief officer resources, and I've heard briefly that there's a lot of positives coming out of it. Eliminate the duplication of overhead, improve duty coverage. Consideration of operational uh, and uh, consolidation of operational overhead. Right now, you've got two two districts basically doing their own thing, and there's a there's a fair amount of duplication or things that could be done in a more efficient manner. <clears throat> Cooperative opportunities for the first year to include duty coverage, streamlining. These are not our recommendations yet. I'll give you those. 
dedicated training officer in firework. Depth of human resources, economy of scale, standardization of the SOPs and the SOGs, again, moving forward, operating as one. Larger pool, depth of resources, span of control. It's a big deal for us in emergency services. How many people, how, truly, how many people can one supervisor effectively supervise? The enhancement of the specialty teams, both departments have specialty teams. Uh, staffing and enhanced utilization, utilization of current resources and talents. And as I said, there are numerous, numerous statements within the study from the stakeholders. So let's, let's what if. Let's take a look at to some of the opportunities that I've picked out of the study that are in front of you to possibly enhance services of consolidated agency. So we all recognize this picture. This is Central's current truck, and new one is on order. In the CityGate study, it does talk about the recommendation to relocate the existing uh, central truck. However, the CityGate study was not a consolidation study. So again, what we did is we got up in elevation a little bit, and I sat with our GIS analyst, and I went in. So first of all, Marsha, I want you to take the target hazards and the critical facilities and plot them out as if it was one district. Then, I want you to move the truck up. So, as a result, here's the map that occurred as a result, and you'll see the little teepees or uh, triangles, red triangles, are critical facilities and then target hazards. And you'll see them somewhat grouped. And then you also see a footprint, a travel time footprint for the truck. Truck company, we, we like to see on the first alarm. We like to see it there within eight minutes. So it could be part of the effective response force, which is made up of X number of pieces of apparatus, X number of, pe X number of personnel. So after moving it around a few times and, and, and looking where the best, as a consolidated agency, serve the entire footprint of the response area. And it's our, that you'll see it in the report, it's our recommendation that the truck company be relocated to Aptos 1 for a while. We also, this was not a fire station relocation study. However, the opportunity presented itself to start moving a few things around, especially when we realized the situation with uh, Aptos, I'm sorry, with Central 3 and 4. Again, I got with the GIS analyst, we started looking around, and we came up with this recommendation that a new station, in, in my terminology, task force, a multi-company, multi-crew station, be located in this, in, in this vicinity. Not necessarily that exact corner, but in that general vicinity. And the reason is, again, and you'll see multiple maps in there, response maps, is we believe that enhances, number one, it enhances the response footprint but number two, it gives you a facility that will last well into the future. And uh, an offer I, I will make to the districts that I'm not going to offer a full consult or a station relocation study for free. In, uh, in the event they come up with two or three locations they'd like us to map, uh, we'll do a little bit of uh, mapping uh, and runtime analysis. Question on a runtime analysis always comes up. We use real streets, we use the posted speed limits. The program does take into account turns and grades. If you've had the opportunity to read the city gate studies, the consultant talks about a quick response unit. Um, we took that to another level and um, 
we are recommending that both districts consider putting in place something like this. This is a quick attack unit that is nimble, it's smaller than a fire engine, uh, and it can be staffed with a medic and an operator or a captain or however, depending on how it's configured, it can do EMS calls, it can initiate cutting rescues. Um, I've had personal experience with these types of units, and I've been tracking several other agencies that are now starting to implement these because of call load and because of traffic situations. So let's, let's what if, personally I think quick attacks are the thing in the future, they're already here. So we took a look at, remember those call concentration areas I showed you earlier? We, we narrowed it down and said, okay, again to the GIS analyst, if we were going to put a quick attack unit, where would it park? Now, understand, I am not your typical fire chief. I have no problem with taking a unit and putting it on a, on a street corner. Tualatin Valley Fire and Rescue up in Oregon actually has storefront stations for certain times of the day so the crews can get in out of the heat. But what we've, what we've calculated is if you're going to put a quick response unit in service, this is one of the best places to park it. Now, when you get into the study, you will also see we spend a fair amount of time looking at time of day, type of call, etc. <coughs> and when we did that, it was really, really interesting because the people we call peak hours are different in the two districts. So, Here's the hot spot, if you will. And the guys that are here from the line, they already know this. They didn't need a map. This is the hot spot for Aptos. Aptos is silver. Again, when you get into the report, different hours, different times of day, literally, if the recommendation to stand up a pilot was followed, I believe you could run the pilot with one unit and float it back and forth on the appropriate days, appropriate times. And obviously, I mean, this is really a no-brainer. When is one of the best times to, to stand those units up and get it on a street corner somewhere is when you've got bumper to bumper traffic out here on the highway, in my opinion. So that's all the response stuff I'm going to give you. We're going to transition into finance, and, and let me throw out a few things here. I've done budgets. I've had really good people. I've, I've run multi-million dollar organizations. I've had really good people. When we made the decision, when we got, when we started off on, on this project and started looking at the complexity and some of the concerns that came out during the stakeholder interviews, I said to Don, I, I recommend we, we bring the, the CPA that the company uses on projects throughout the United States on board. And as a result of that, no extra cost to the clients, Don and I just shifted some of our hours over. And to show you the complexity, this is a list of the resources, the studies, the documents that the CPA utilized during the, the, during the financial analysis and projections. It's extensive. Uh, the Bickmore study, which is attached to the report, was a very, very interesting document. And if, if you have time to read that, I would encourage you to. I'm actually using that now as an example to other folks who are talking about unfunded liabilities, who are talking about what it's, what it's gonna take. This is the level of detail you have to go to. We had input from, fire, from the fire district staff. Uh, our CPA consulted the tax assessors uh, roles and office uh, via their website. The CalPERS actuarials that are quoted within the Bickmore report are extremely, extremely important. We looked, he looked at the MOU, memorize and understand it. We looked at operating agreements and he, and if those of you who have read the City Gate Report, there's a fairly, um, there's a section, a 
in the Aptos of Silva that does talk about finances. He did take a look at that. I won't say he did. We looked at the two districts' actuaries. We looked at their audits. So he didn't walk into this blindly, obviously. As we were, as he was producing the projections, the basis for the projections, this is just a few bullets, MOUs. And I think it's important that we qualify, and, and I asked the, the CPA's name is Randy. I asked him several times. I want to make sure I've got this right, Randy. What's in there is no freezes. It's basically status quo. He said, that's right. Whatever increases were in the MOUs were in the, are in the projections. I said, okay. He did acknowledge the challenges regarding pay disparity, pay freezes, etc. That's part of the implementation plan and part of the negotiation process. I also need to throw out, we have been extremely careful not to give the appearance of predetermining the outcome of negotiations, which is why you look at what's going on now and what's projected in the MOUs. There's a really big, there's a section of law in California that that would be considered bargaining in bad faith. So I am not going to show you every single chart that's in that report. It, it, there's a lot. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of highlights, but know that before the one I'm going, to, before the ones I'm going to show you were developed, and part of the RFP, we looked at each district's finances using these guidelines, using those references, and did a five-year projection for each district as if they were standalone. And then, as is required by the RFP, um, he took a look at what could be what the cost savings could be. There's two models in the report. There's a Model A and a Model B. I'm going to show you Model A, not the car. So the consolidation will allow for a streamlining of costs. It'll allow for the elimination, elimination of some duplicate costs. And they're, they're listed for you. They're in the book. And admittedly, this slide is, is based on some, some reduction of, of duplication of positions. But at the end of the day, per the projection, and you see it right down there at the bottom, it, gets, it goes up and up every single year. It's a five-year forecast. So we roll that in to what would a combined district look like. And that is the bottom line. What all that information, all that stuff that, not a very technical term, all those references, all those studies, all those actuaries, all those audits, Randy looked at, looked at, took all the information from staff, plugged it into a spreadsheet, and this is the CPA's projection of what a consolidated district would look like each year for five years. Bottom line, no deficit, positive growth. Now I will tell you, one of the formulas used is the formula that's allowed by uh, CalPERS, our retirement system, for, for spreading out basically over 30 years the unfunded liability. Now you will see within the report both districts as of 2016, because that's the information first gave us, it talks about what each district has as far as unfunded liabilities. But I will share, also share with you that both districts have been making strides to address and get their arms around the unfunded liabilities. And the chiefs and their staff can address that for you much better than I. So again, Model A and Model B, right? This is Model A. This is what an org chart, an organization chart, could look like in the event there was a consolidation. You heard me talk about span of control. You heard me talk about you know, the ability to, to divvy up the duties, basically. And as I look at this organization chart, 
and I stand back at it, and I was just looking at it this afternoon in the hotel room. All the pieces are there. It's got a good span of control, particularly up at the top. It's got chief officers. It has uh, a, a fully staffed administrative unit. And this is an organization that, in our opinion, can run that corporation which is basically a $30,000 a year corporation. Now, it's not a pie in the sky. It doesn't come without considerations. And these are some issues, some of the, some of the challenges, I don't like the word issues, that are going to need to be addressed during the process. Parity is a big deal for firefighters on, on the line for all of us. Um, benefit packages. It's no secret that one organization's benefit package is more positive than the other. Uh, both organizations have, been, have, been, have been identified for both departments, for both districts, capital improvement and apparatus replacement programs. Now I also know that while we were putting this together, the districts have been moving forward to develop these, and I'm not sure if they've been to the board yet. Combining two bargaining units into one. Never an easy task. However, it can be done. Evaluation and modification of the deployment schedule, and that's simply just moving people around, in particular, staff in the truck. Consideration should be given the ideas and recommendations in the Bickmore report. That's a hefty report. It wasn't cheap. I'm not complaining. Um, but there's some really solid recommendations in that report from a third party actuary. We had no influence on that. Analysis of the district, and this is the, the, here's your bottom line on the CPA's analysis, okay? Annual class, cap, the, the analysis reveals that combined districts are forecast to produce, to produce a positive cash flow. Why am I lingering on that? Because during the stakeholder interviews, there was a lot of concern that was brought up about cash flow from either agency. And you'll see what's in that last bullet there is exactly what was on the slide before this. So, in our CPA's opinion. The consolidation will provide multiple opportunities to improve service. I, I believe we've, we've laid that out for you all the way from the beginning when we looked at the organization as a whole. Elimination of redundant uh, uh, expenses, standardization, reduce administrative positions, it, as you already know, are in the forecast. Savings will be realized under both forecasts A and B. The extent is determined by the staff and model decision. Thank you, Kurt. All right, so from Alaska's standpoint, uh, we looked at there are very op various options for cooperative efforts. Uh, and, and this we run through this list, staying as, as the agencies are, advanced auto aid systems, functional consolidation. Now that is what Kurt referred to there with regard to the pilot program that the two districts are involved in now to share a chief officer. Uh, contract for service uh, is, is allowed and, and often used. Uh, operational consolidation is they're functioning as one agency. Joint Powers Authority, uh, this is forming a new agency with different representatives, and um, uh, it, I want to say in the past it did not require LAFCO approval, but there are certain instances now where it is required, and they're also required to uh, file their information with LAFCO, so LAFCO can keep track of the different uh, local, local agencies providing services. 
legal unification is the actual legally forming and combining of the two districts. And that's the one I want to get into that a bit more. Commissioner Leopold went into a very good description of LASCO background. And uh, one thing that I would also include in there is that LAFCOs reflect local conditions. When they were first set up, there was a thought that they would be a state organization uh, come down with a mandate on uh, local, local uh, areas. Uh, the state organization of the Board of Supervisors and of city councils uh, objected to this and so it was changed to be an organization that's much more reflective of local conditions. You have uh, two supervised, two county supervisors, uh, two city council members, a public member, and Santa Cruz LAFCO has uh, two special di districts representatives. These are elected, locally elected officials and they set local policies that conform to the state mandate. So it is very much reflective of the local conditions. So when we come to legal unification, which is that next piece that LAFCO is involved in, there is forming a totally new district. Uh, there is, which is discouraged with LAFCO because there's been a proliferation of, of districts out there. Uh, consolidation of districts, which does form the two districts coming together in a consolidation do form a new district. A reorganization is a combination of actions that are occurring within one application. An annexation is a single action of, of property coming, territory coming into an existing district. Oftentimes I've heard merger, the C word is, is often, con consolidation word is often avoided uh, in some areas. Uh, and so they, I hear them oftentimes using the term merger, but actually merger is, is if there's a city involved. So it really doesn't apply when you have two districts coming together. Now, I emphasize in the report I have all of the terms and conditions. That's in the appendix and then I run through them in the report as well. But I bring this up because it's extremely important to note that LAFCO has a considerable amount of authority to attach terms and conditions to uh, an action that, that they've approved. Um, and it is in those terms and conditions, when you look at the list of what can be addressed in the terms and conditions, you realize that so many of the issues that, that come up can be addressed in this uh, portion. So, and the districts, have the authority when they make application to LAFCO to include terms and conditions in there. So that's where I want to really emphasize the fact that these kind of details can be worked out prior to the application. Now I'm moving on to the service review update. Uh, and there again, Commissioner Leopold explained uh, both the sphere of influence and the service review. Uh, these are the factors that are considered uh, when reviewing uh, um, the services provided by a local agency. Uh, LAFCOs have the authority to either look at service, conduct a service review by area or by type of service. Um, and uh, Santa Cruz LAFCO has looked at it by type of service, so in this case, of course, fire service. Uh, in the report, I've broken down each one of these factors to be considered where and where they have been addressed within the report. Now, sphere of influence, there again, you heard that's a probable physical boundary of, uh, of an agency. These are the determinations to be considered uh, when updating the sphere of influence. And as mentioned, uh, this, of course, is really looking at the public service portion of it. This is the current sphere of influence for Aptos La Silva. And this is the current sphere of influence for Central Fire. Our findings, once again, as I mentioned, are in the report, uh, and that neither district expressed any kind of interest in expanding their spheres. 
Um, and they definitely have the capacity to, that's been addressed in the report, their facilities and their capacity to be able to provide the service. Um, and also their need for future uh, facilities. Therefore, it is our recommendation now, it's important to understand that any of our recommendations in the report come from our professional experience and the research that we've done. We have no authority to implement these recommendations. That is up to the decision makers. So what we have proposed is a combining of the two existing spheres for if there's a consolidation of the districts then to, to see this as the sphere of influence. All right. Only 50 more slides to go. <laughs> Only kidding. So these, there's like 19 or 20 recommendations in the study. I'm only going to give you the highlights. First of all, obviously, we believe that the two districts, it makes a lot of sense. They're both successful products of previous consolidations and annexations. Anyway, there's, you know, we're recommending to jointly address the standards of coverage and master plan recommendations. That was an easy one, right? Standardized policies, you've already seen that come out of the uh, stakeholders. Mobile data terminal hardware, when we're doing the interviews, uh, was discovered that one agency has, one does not, and they're getting ready to move forward. Uh, it makes complete sense for that to be standardized. You've already saw the talk about facilities. There needs to be a facility improvement, relocation, and new station uh, uh, plan. Uh, apparatus replacement plan. As we look at agencies, and this is not that unusual, if you know, some of the folks in the room remember Proposition 13. Chris, you remember Proposition 13. Anyway, what, what happened with Proposition 13 is a lot of the agencies, a lot of the entities ended up stripping out the plans that we're actually recommending in order to survive. So as a result, we all got into a habit of when we had a good year, we would buy apparatus, and then we had a series of bad years, and we didn't buy apparatus. What we're recommending is we go back to the old way of doing things and develop those replacement plans and fund them. Address the administrative support needs, address the critical tasking needs. You'll see multiple pages in the document about critical tasking. Fully staffed the truck company. Contract, consolidated administrative functions, uh, there, there is a precursor note within the study. We believe this is a good move, much like the, the pilot programs going on, chair and chief officers. Consider implementation of the quick attack units. I know it sounds a little foreign sometimes to the line personnel. Uh, I have personally had resistance to it, and after 30 days, they wanted another one. <clears throat> and initiate the LAFCO process. Bottom line, you figured out the bottom line. Our recommendation, we believe that forming a consolidated district is a viable option, it's cost effective, it enhances services, it's in the long term best interest. When you look at those maps and you think about operating both the districts as one, I mean, we're all here for the interest of the community and service to the community. And in our opinion, that's exactly what comes out of, the, out of this consolidation. And we recommend that uh, you take the steps to pursue it. In the document is a draft implementation plan. In case anybody thinks this is an overnight process, take a look at the draft implementation plan. In the event, at some point, the elected officials decide to move forward, there's a lot of work still to be done. And with that,
thank Kurt and Don for their presentation, for the hard work. Um, it, was, it, it was a long presentation, not as long as I thought, so congratulations. Uh, and there was a lot of information. There's a lot more information in the report. And for those who are interested, I, I suggest that you uh, take a look at it. We are going to ask uh, uh, questions. As I stated earlier, we're not taking actions on this this evening. Um, we, we wanted to hear the presentation. Um, the, the districts uh, decided to do a joint uh, presentation uh, so we could hear each other's questions uh, from the consultants. Uh, so I'm going to first look to our LATCO commissioners and see if there are any questions that, uh, that our members have. Okay. Well, then I will look to the Central Fire District uh, and see if there's any questions you have of uh, uh, Don or Kurt about the presentation. Okay. Well, I think it's just questions right now. Uh, so now look to the Atlas LaSelva board. Are there questions that people have about the presentation? If we could get the underlying data for the travel times analysis that's done in this report. Um, I know you said that you plug in things like hills, curves, and so on, but uh, I know that there's got to be some data about the engine speeds, the engine travel times on San Andreas Road, Freedom Boulevard, Soquel Drive. And I, I would like to be able to see those for our board. Computer program uses the postal speed limits. Okay. Other questions from Atlas and Selva? There'll be times at the end to make comments about all this, but I will also want to see if there are members of the public who have questions. Mr. Foster, do you have a question? No. Okay. Well, then um, uh, we'll ask to see whether members of the public have questions that they want to ask about today's presentation. I'm going to give a moment for the microphone to get down there. Uh, uh, you're welcome to share your views about whether you think this is a good idea or a bad idea to even take a look at it. Uh, but I want to encourage you to think about questions uh, that, uh, that came up for you in regards to this report uh, because we have the consultants here. There will be time at each of the uh, boards and if it ever made it to LAFCO to express uh, what you want to happen with this. Uh, but this is an opportunity to ask questions of the consultants who put together this report. Are there questions? There's going to be microphones on each side, so if you just raise your hand, they'll come find you. Uh, good evening. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for the good uh, presentation. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I live in rural Aptos in an area that is um, served by Aptos and Selva on the first attack. Um, some questions that I had, you mentioned that the peak service times vary between the two districts. So I wondered if those uh, differing peak service times were considered in um, the possible hours for the quick attack stations and if it would be possible to have uh, those same personnel serve those two quick attacks and to still be able to accommodate the increased service needs of those peak times for the, um, the different areas. I also had a question about um, the recommendation to demolish, I guess, or abandon stations three and four in the central fire district when it looks like that is really the busy area for central fire district. And if in doing so, um, and just putting in one uh, major station and a quick attack, if that would really provide the level of service that the very busy area of Central would need. Um, I also had a question about um, if this study has taken into account the county's plans for um, dense infill development and increased heights of buildings, and um, if, if those plans, if you were talking with the county planning department, um, and certainly MBAG and some of those agencies that are driving the bus for what the development uh, picture
future might look for look like in our, our future and also um, anticipated water needs. Thank you. Okay, there's a lot of questions there. Um, uh, do your best to answer them, and then uh, if it doesn't all get answered, we can uh, deal with it at, at one of the respective boards. So. Peak hour units, uh, we're recommending a pilot, and I think the question was, could that one unit be floated on those different days and hours? not my decision to make. However, I did recommend the pilot program, and during the pilot program, if you take a look at the data that's in there, as far as, far as peak hours, and double check it with the, with the current data, I believe running the pilot in that manner could possibly work as a pilot. Understanding the pilot, recommending consideration to give the staffing that with overtime to prove whether or not the theory will work. Um, three and four. So as we look at the, the mapping and the street layout, moving a station, especially you know, station three is within three miles or so of Aptos one. Um, and actually, I believe if you, if you were able to lift the crew out of the congestion and looking at the way the streets are laid out, you're not gonna add that much time response times. I know there's been a lot of discussion about taking me out of the busiest area. But stop and think about this. I showed you all the call concurrency. The question is, how many times is that unit even available to run all their own calls? Units are, are coming in from other areas. And like I said, I'm willing to run two or three models, not a full station relocation study, but two or three models to prove whether or not some of the ideas and the locations that I know the chiefs have been talking about will enhance service or not. Bottom line is those stations, something has to be done with them. It won't come accommodate expansion. County planning, I don't have an answer for that. It is, it is a component of the analysis. Um, and I believe what, what we've found in all the studies is growth, projected growth is actually minimal. Thank you. That's the best I can do. There was a question over here. here. Uh, two questions. Huh? Yeah, two questions. My name is Craig Shatter. You give us your name. Craig Shatter. I'm from the uh, Aptos Larkin Valley area. Two questions. Number one, are the relocation costs recommend the costs associated with the relocation recommendations included somewhere in the report? I don't think I saw them there, and I didn't see them mentioned today. Uh, I'd like to know what those would be and how that might affect future planning. Secondly. You didn't say much about this, but apparently there's an assumption that the call uh, numbers will increase over time. And I'm wondering if there's something you can say about that. I don't have any data specifically, but I understood that perhaps due to improved construction mechanisms that actually fires are maybe less uh, prevalent. And is that needing to go up to fires? Is it other things that are causing those calls? What drives that increased call cost? Relocation costs were not included. Um, we were not asked to do that analysis. Uh, we talked about it a little bit, and um, cost of building fire stations, particularly in an area where you have hard time finding land, is, uh, is not cheap. Uh, in the event that any of those recommendations were embraced, then obviously part of the implementation plan and the planning process would identify what those costs might be and where they may come from. Call increases. On average, in this day and age in the West, particularly in California, your fire department responds to roughly two to four percent true fire calls. There's another makeup, and I'll let the chiefs address it. That is not the only thing that drives the call increases. Call increases are driven by um, age, by density, by tourism by the associated risks with having the type of responses that are, that are covered here. And so when we look at it then in total, that's where your increases are. You're going to see, you're going to see increases in medical aids, you're going to then see increases in water rescues, you're going to see increases in help by fallen and can't get ups, um, we call those others. 
and uh, I'd like to defer to the chiefs to give you the, the full breakdown. The breakdown is actually in the report. As uh, Kurt mentioned, it's, it's not just about fighting fires anymore. We are very heavily engaged with EMS from the advanced life support side of the house, which is our paramedics for both of our agencies. Uh, we do numerous open water rescues in the ocean. Uh, that seems to kind of be the normal day-to-day -day activity for us. We're doing vehicle accidents constantly. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's on highway one or our surface streets. Um, the, the pickup and putbacks, as Kurt mentioned, are the other type of calls, are a daily event for both of our agencies. So the, the fires are lessening, and, and that's based upon our, our fire marshal for both districts, our prevention bureaus, our community risk reduction uh, attitude. Um, so even though we're, we're still the fire service and we do respond to fires every time the alarm goes off, those are not our number one priority. Our number one call right now is the priority for response. Was there another question? Another question for anyone here? Raise your hands. Right here. I have a, I have a question, but I do have a statement. And uh, I want to commend the Aptos Lasalva Fire Board and the Central Fire Board for having the guts to stand up and finally start talking to each other. You know, I've been in the fire service, affiliated with the fire service for 49 years. And when I first started, we had 21 fire districts in Santa Cruz County, one of the smallest counties in the state, and we have 21. We're down to 13 now, and I really want to commend both the board members and the two fire chiefs we're finally standing up and having got enough to, to start talking to each other. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions? Well, Ms. Steinberg, before you go, I just want to make sure anybody else who hasn't had a chance to ask a question, I'll give you a second. Uh, oh, well, let's get this gentleman right here. Usually only allow one uh, stop at the mic, uh, but given that we have a low number of questions, I'll ask you, let you ask a brief question, Mr. Steinbrenner, but let's see if some of you guys have a chance. Uh, thank you, my name is TJ Welch, and uh, first I want to thank LAFCO and uh, both boards and the fire chiefs and the labor groups for uh, making this step, because it's a, I think it's an essential step and it's uh, long overdue. Obviously I'm pro-consolidation, but uh, maybe not for the reasons that some would think, and one of my concerns I'm going to pose in the, in a way of a question here, it is the, uh, the financial savings that was, was mentioned, which um, is why I'm pro-consolidation, but not so much to save the money necessarily, um, but to see that money put back into uh, the uh, fire service so we can meet a standard. And, and uh, quite frankly, I was pretty disappointed in the standards of coverage studies that came out for both APOS and, and Central Fire, because I think they missed the mark. And they missed the mark because they, they went for a standard that is uh, something that um, is, I guess, within reason that the fire service is looking at today. But we, we in Santa Cruz County fall way short of meeting national standards, NFP 1710. So my question would be, and, and this maybe is more for the boards than it is for the chiefs um, than it is for um, uh, ESCI, is how do we, or are you looking at ways to reinvest those savings to uh, maybe get closer to the FPA 17 standards and get the appropriate time standards out there? We, we have some great firefighters in, in this area. I, I know many of them. Uh, I've talked with many of them and, and kind of worked in the area. Uh, we have great firefighters. It's not the problem about the, the members that we have. We have two chiefs now who are willing to work together and they're showing uh, the ways that they can put together for training, prevention of the time she's working together now. Those are all great moves to be more effective and efficient, but we still fall way short of that standard. So um, are we looking at how we uh, get closer to the MPA standards uh, with that funding? And I guess well, what well, was... Well, TJ, I, I just want to... Uh, we're, we're trying to focus on the study, and you're, you're talking about another study that we didn't present here this evening. Well, I guess this is my concern. The study shows a savings, right? Uh, the gentleman that just sitting next to me is assistant to the city manager of Capitola, 
of where, where I reside. Uh, right now, he's going to the city manager, I'm sure, saying, hey, there's going to be the savings. Of, I guess my concern in the study is if it shows the savings, but in reality, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want people to be misled because I really think that, that the study should show that we, be, we could, and I'll be honest, the QRV is something I'm not real warm to, but I guess I, I'll leave that up to the experts. But um, if, if that's a standard, then how do we get closer to meeting a bigger picture with the savings? I, I just don't want to end it with, we have a savings. Here uh, briefly from uh, the, 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 the fire district board. This is this is a, a little off the topic, and I, and I just want to also say that there's a lot of if for us to move forward uh, on this, so for the districts to move forward on this, there's going to be a lot more discussions, a lot more uh, deeper dive than we'll get here this evening. But I'm not sure if um, uh, 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 Mr. Miller, you wanted to uh, say anything. I know TJ, we go back a ways. Uh, but in, in my opinion, this is, that's actually what this part of the study is all about. Um, each, right now there's two boards, and each of those boards, one of the biggest things we do is, how do we spend your money to give you the best possible service we can get? And we have to break it down accordingly on what you saw in the part of the study, benefits for employees, but again, apparatus, um, housing of our personnel, that all comes into play. This is another option that is being looked at that could improve the service. And I think that's what both boards want to see. The bottom line, does this improve the service to the folks we serve? Um, there will be, a, if we go down this road and we consolidate, there will be a brand new board that will have those decisions to make when there's savings on where those savings go, whether it's a combined new station spending, whether it's for personnel costs or putting new folks on, on the line. Um, or in admin, who knows? But that would be for a new board. But this study is part of that resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there other questions that people have? I'm just looking, seeing that anybody who hasn't had a chance to ask a question. I said we're not here. Uh, Brian with the Central Fire. Um, the one question I do have is, uh, were you able to identify in the course of your study any similar or like special districts in the Greater Bay Area to offer a best practices example of an administrative structure in order to help validate the proposed merged structure that you have in your uh, study? The simple answer is no. Uh, that was not part of the scope of work nor the RFP. The more com complex answer is, it goes back to what I said earlier, and that's the review of the two studies that have previously been done, the interviews uh, with the chiefs of the organizations, the interim reps at the time, and the fact that some of us have run fire districts in the past. And when you take a look at the duties, and when you take a look, actually, when you take a look at the CityGate study, um, the the organization that Central is building is very similar to what they recommended. So we were not asked to compare it with anybody else. I'm sure there's comparisons out there. Uh, I would be honest with you, most districts in this day and age have pretty much stripped their admin down as far as they can to get through the recession to keep to keep crews on the, on the ground. So now many are now just now starting to rebuild their administrative functions very, very cautiously because you never know when the next recession is around the corner. Uh, other questions? I'll let Ms. Steinbrenner have a second bite of the apple if she's brief. Can't get, we'll only ask four questions. But. Thank you very much, Becky Steinbrenner, again, and thank you for you know, allowing me another chance. I had it here, but I didn't wait. Um, I had a question, like some clarification about moving the ladder truck to Tulsa Silver Fire Station at one. Um, does that mean there would have to be additional facilities built at AP1 to house a truck of this size? I don't know if the current one could. And um, my second question is, would this um, consolidation of whatever, if 
you know, goes forward in whatever form, include someone that would be, um, I was happy to see a full-time training officer. Um, uh, would there also be, would that include training staff for uh, successor responsibilities so that when um, a division chief leaves, there are people that have been well trained to move up through the ranks in-house? And I guess I've got a third question, sorry. Um, what about a permanent um, in-house plan checker that reviews uh, building permit applications and is very familiar with the area and the problems rather than putting them out to contract as that process all the currently does now. Thank you. I'm done. All right. Well, just let, let the record reflect that I let you have a second question and you broke the rules. But uh, uh, we'll see if we can get those answered. I'll take the second one. I'll refer to the Chiefs on the first one. In review, it was very refreshing, by the way, when I saw this recommendation and these concerns in the city gate settings, because this is an area that has been very, very weak and ignored in the fire service, and that's succession planning. And we fully believe with, with the retirements that are taking place, that succession planning should be the next step once the organization consolidates, so I'm not trying to study the job. <coughs> However, I do those. But, um, so, and for all those reasons, we recommend there's cross-training with staff, with the admin staff, we recommend that succession plans start taking place in the event that you don't, so you don't lose the institutional memory every time somebody retires. And I'll let the chiefs field the first question. I'll take the first and the third of the three, though this was in two. <laughs> the ladder the, the ladder truck moving to station one. That is something that we're looking into, uh, depending on when the new ladder truck gets here. Uh, there's more to it than just whether the vehicle will fit inside the station. Um, the members of both Aptos and Central need to have discussion about where the, the dorms would be and, and other considerations. Um, like we talked about, there, there's a lot more to it than just putting a vehicle into a station. So there's a lot of discussion that needs to occur between the management, labor, administration, the board uh, for that to occur. Uh, reiterate the succession plan. Right now, uh, I'm new to this area, four months here. Uh, I gotta commend everybody here that, that, that's part of the community, Aptos to sell the firefighters, central firefighters, the staff, the boards. Um, I come from an area where we don't have a lot of, of communication and collaboration, and it's impressive. So what we've done with the chief officers right now and, and working with, with labor is, is we're developing a plan to work not only internally but also externally with our, with our, our neighbors to the north uh, and central. One of those things that we have done is we have a shared inspector service uh, that we do share an inspector with them. Um, chief Hall mentioned the community risk reduction model, which is something I'm used to. Um, it provides a proactive approach to you know, hopefully evaluate that data. Maybe we can reduce those incident numbers by understanding what we're going to and how we can reduce that risk. But that might be something we use as a cost savings from, from, from what this, 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 this study provides us. There's a lot of opportunity here, um, and I think that's why one of the reasons this board picked me is because I, I presented those. That we, we have a great relationship, and I think that the, both labor organizations and us are working together with our boards to explore every opportunity, including moving the ladder truck, including succession plan, and, and having a, a more robust community risk reduction uh, model that has our own personnel there to provide the best level of protection, not only for you as, as, as citizens, but that level also protects our firefighters. The less exposure I can give them to going to incidents, the better job we're doing as board of directors and leaders. Thank you. Um, if they could bring back up the uh, microphones up here, um, I'm going to ask uh, uh, each one of our boards to see whether they ha uh, have some comments that they would like to make. I'll look to my fellow commissioners on LATCO, uh, see if they want to make any comments. Thank you, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, I'd like to make a, just a brief comment that, uh, you know, LATCO, this is not a LATCO-driven process, even though we recognize that there are but there's the authority here. This really is something that's in a significant amount of deference to these two districts. This is something that the districts have brought to and requested, as Supervisor Leopold mentioned at the onset, and it's not something that LAFCO is trying to impose or require. Uh, it's really something that would be, 
we're looking to the boards and the two districts to say what's best for your districts and how can we help facilitate what's best uh, for your districts. And I think that that's, a, that's not necessarily how it plays out across the state. And I think as Chief Flo mentioned, there's a remarkable amount of collaboration that's already gone on into this and a remarkable amount of collaboration uh, in the fire service in this county in general. And LAFCO is here just to serve a facilitation role more than anything else. Yeah, just a few comments. First of all, I'm very pleased that this process is going through. The uh, report, I believe, is a very good start. However, there are a lot of things that the decision makers are going to have to deal with in terms of actually come up, coming up with an implementation. And I'd like to just tell a few things, at least in my mind, after reading this report, which is a pretty massive thing, uh, that there, there are some questions of trying to figure out what's going to be the most gritty type of point that's going to take real effort on the point of the fire boards and the firefighters that will be involved in this as well. Um, the first thing is that I don't think it's a surprise, but the pension liabilities are an enormous issue. We're talking about from the big Moore report, something like 50% of salaries will have to be paid for go to benefits. Now that's a large amount, and it still doesn't really say how long it takes to get out of the hole here. Now one thing that I did notice in looking at this report is that the actuarial people report the unfunded liability as a function of, as a fraction of payroll. More commonly, it's done as a fraction of the total um, actual actuarial liability. So I think it would be good that those numbers would be provided, and I'm sure that the consultants have that. The second question is, or comment, is trying to estimate the increase in calls. Now, apparently, Kurt mentioned that the, uh, he has the data for the breakdown by different types of calls, and I assume and I hope he has that historically, because that would be pretty good evidence exactly where the calls are coming from. And I think he's absolutely right. There are a lot of car accidents, there are a lot of um, problems with medical, and he's right that people are getting older and so there may be more risk for that sort of thing as well. And so those, those types of, and then a similar question has to do with the time of day that the various calls are. I'd be quite curious whether automobile accidents or medical, or maybe both are the ones which really occur uh, during a particular time of day. Now I looked at the plot in the report and it's kind of interesting, it's a very broad distribution, that maximum. Basically, it's only in the very early hours of the morning that it's quiet. But there's still like an 18-hour period that it's fairly substantial. So there's going to be some more discussion. Again, I uh, admire the people that are going to do this work. And I certainly think this report is a very good start. Thank you. I wanted to commend the, the presenters for the report and all the work they com completed. Um, I think it really provides a, a really compelling picture about you know, fire service in these districts. And I also wanted to call out the gentleman in the second row who made his comments about the leadership for the boards of these two fire districts and on evaluating this. The city of Santa Cruz recently went through a merger with the UCSC fire department and Frankly, there were some, you know, at first during the nego negotiations um, challenges, but I think it's, if you were to speak to the, uh, the firefighters there, they, they feel that it has been moving in, in a really positive direction. So I think it's good that we're having this discussion here. I also want to just say that um, this is an opportunity when you look at the service delivery and the scope of influence, it provides an opportunity for us to kind of see what type of service delivery is taking place and really evaluate how we're working um, as a public agency, as public agencies to, to better serve Santa Cruz County. So I think that doing these types of reviews are really important for us moving forward and they provide a really good context for our um, ability to serve the public in the best and the highest possible way. Lowell Hurst here, uh, Mayor of Watsonville. I just want to say and commend all the, all the folks in the audience here as well as 
uh, the, the chiefs and the staff members here, not everybody wants to talk about these difficult issues, and, and everybody here is interested in that. So commendations to uh, all the brave and bold people in the room that are willing to take on this, this tough, this tough uh, discussion. I think one of the things that, uh, and I don't know if it's a question or just a statement, that how do we access data, how do we uh, filter that and, and find uh, ways to generate predictive uh, prevention and utilize technologies like um, auto vehicle locators and what's going to be new on the scene as far as technology and prevention and, and being there when things happen. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all my fellow uh, commissioners. Now I'll look to the Atos La Selva district to see if there's any comments from there. <coughs> Mr. Foster. Uh, thank you. So just a couple of uh, brief comments. One, uh, special thanks to our partners in this again, um, ESCI, uh, LAFCO, and the Central Fire Protection District. I think that as, as sort of been said by members of the public and other folks up here on stage that this is really an important step and, and a long process, a long discussion about looking at things um, in a different lens uh, for these communities. So I'm really proud to be a part of it, as I'm sure everybody up here on stage and in the audience is too. Um, as I mentioned in my opening comments, thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you all for being engaged in this process. We still have a long ways to go to, to look through these recommendations and the, the information that's in this report. There'll be a lot more stuff that'll come up in conversations that will be had at public meetings with both um, fire districts here in the coming months. So I hope all of you will come along for the ride and, uh, and bring more people as well too to engage on this and provide community feedback because really at the end of the day, what we're trying to do here is make sure that both districts are serving their communities as best they possibly can, providing the, the, the highest level, highest degree of service. So, uh, again, thank you all for being engaged, and please remain engaged as we move on down the line with this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, just, I have a couple of points to make uh, looking toward the future. Uh, first of all, I've felt uh, for many years that uh, the ideas of 30 years ago about joining the different fire districts was the right idea, and it, it's still the right idea. Um, it's going to take some time. Um, Charlie, I uh, remember well when there were 21 fire districts, and uh, a friend of mine named Charlie Weaver, who you also remember from the Sheriff's Office, and I sat one night and tried to figure out how to cut down all the police departments and fire departments. And after all the martinis that we drank trying to figure that out, I don't think we got our math right, but uh, the idea has been percolating for years, and we still joke about that from 40 years ago. Um, I think the elephant in the room, point number two, the elephant in the room is the uh, uh, parity of bargaining units. Uh, if you read the report in depth, it talks about the potential, and again, these are ideas to talk about, uh, not something to uh, get angry about, but right now it talks about the potential of Y rating or freezing compensation of the Aptos to Silver membership while the central membership catches up. That is definitely going to be something that's going to be discussed. Um, and so people have to start thinking now about whether that's the way to do it or whether there are alternatives. Um, and the last thing I think, uh, looking ahead three years, four years, five years, is the success or failure of uh, unifying these agencies is probably going to be with the Aptos and Silver Fire Protection District. Because when you look at the response times and you look at the history of Aptos and Silva, you'll see that people are going to be very sensitive to the idea that they're going to be told that their fire department is now going to be headquartered on 17th Avenue. And they'll ask, well, is a fire engine going to come faster than seven minutes to my area in Seascape or Freedom Boulevard or Larkin Valley? Or am I still going to get a fire engine in seven minutes, but my government will be on 17th Avenue? And I think that's going to be the big question that's going to make or break this deal. And so I think it's a mistake to not present a plan that includes a future structure 
not just the future governing structure, but an actual future structure of where the fire stations would be, where the people would be, the membership would be, and what the response times would be. Because you're not going to sell it to that bus in the Silva if you tell them that they get a seven minute response time and we're going to change the name on the doors. So I would hope that going forward, that there be much more granularity, much more detail in the plan. And one of those things would be even the name of the agency. Right now it's titled the Mid-County Fire Agencies, which again is just a title for talking about agencies that are generally speaking in the Mid-County. But if you've ever had the pleasure of listening to the historians of the Rio College like Sandy Lydon, uh, they will tell you that South County begins at the Aptos Creek Bridge. And that's about halfway through the Aptos and Silver Fire Protection District. And so when you start talking about, oh boy, we're going to be central, you just told half the Aptos and Silver District that they're going to be redesignated geographically. Again, politically something to think about in the future, about how you sell it to the people I live with. Now I'll look to our uh, members of the Central Fire District. Uh, Mr. Miller, uh, if you or any of the other members want to uh, make any final comments. Uh, again, I just thank all the partners who are here today. I don't have to repeat them all again, so you don't have to try and shorten this as much as possible. Um, I, this, this is an opportunity. Um, we, we needed a starting point. I've been a part of successful mergers. This. There's been studies about this merger before, and we haven't gone for it. Um, you just heard a number of issues that are going to be out there. Uh, what I've seen is mergers have failed because they've been rushed, or they've had set dates they've got to get things done by. We have a lot of questions to answer. This study is going to help us get started. And the important thing that I think is different in the past is that we have boards that are two boards that are interested in it. We have the firefighters from both unions interested in it. We have management groups that are interested in it. So in other words, we have a real opportunity. So I think we need, we need to exhaust this to make sure that we don't miss an opportunity here to move forward and give a better service to the folks that rely on us for our response times, for the personnel we send them. Um, so again, patience, be a part of the process. We'd love to hear from you. Um, our meetings are moving to 2 o'clock in the afternoon for Central Fire District, just in case you haven't heard that, second Tuesday of the month. So we'd love to hear from you in September if you are able to make our meeting. But again, thank you for being here tonight. Testing. Uh, first of all, I want to preface my comments by uh, pointing out something that uh, I see. I see a lot of professional firefighters in the audience. I see a lot of people that are related to the fire service in some way, indirectly or directly. Um, and I really want to preface these comments too is the general citizenry that are here today to share something with you that I think is the biggest takeaway from this report. And that is when Kirk talked about response times, effective response forces, and uh, response liability, and he gave you some numbers on four minute travel time and eight minute travel time, et cetera, et cetera. What he was talking about is a national standard from the National Fire Protection Association. And currently, neither agency meets that standard. My hope is that through some kind of staffing model and through the work of all these individuals, we can reach that outcome. And what that outcome means to you, the private, the citizens, is that it a better outcome uh, in regards to EMS response and also to fire response and all um, uh, emergencies. And I think that's the biggest takeaway to take out of this for me personally is we really have an opportunity to really up the level of service for the citizens of both Aptos, the Selva, and Central Fire Protection District. And then finally, I want to share with you, um, as far as taking action, I think probably most of you have heard or know, but we know the devastating fires that occurred in Napa recently. The, the County Board of Supervisors about two weeks ago uh, are now approved the consolidation of 39 fire departments in Sonoma County. They're taking action to make a difference to serve the citizens of that county, and I think that I hope that we can do it here uh, in uh, Santa Cruz County. So, so let me share. 
First of all, thanks for being here. Uh, I'm just going to take your input to make this happen. Um, I was really excited about the study, and I want what's best for our citizens, along with the people on the line, not cutting off the safety. I want just what's best for us. I'm looking forward to actually working to see if we can get this together. Thank, thank you to all the members of uh, both fire district and the commission. Uh, thank you all for uh, being here uh, this evening. Um, it takes a lot of work to put together a report like this, but it takes real leadership to give guidance about what that should look like. These two uh, boards um, have shown real leadership to say, let's ask some tough questions. Uh, let's pay for some good information. Uh, let's have a meaningful discussion. I'm glad that LAFCA was able to participate fully in this. And I also want to recognize Pat McCormack, our long-serving executive officer of Santa Cruz LAFCO. His many years of experience um, have, uh, have, have helped uh, us create uh, a good scope of, of for this uh, report uh, and helped us provide information. So thank you, Pat, for all your work. I also want to express my appreciation to the fire chiefs, uh, Chief Hall and Chief Lowe, who are here tonight, but the uh, Chief Lowe's predecessors, uh, uh, interim uh, uh, fire chiefs, have also been instrumental in providing information, making people accessible, uh, having a staff to, to be available uh, to use with the consultants. Um, it, uh, you, you've, you, you have rolled up your shirt sleeves to help make this happen, so thank you very much. I also want to express my appreciation to our firefighters, not only for what you do every day, uh, but for your leadership in wanting us to take a look at these very difficult questions. Uh, you've shown real leadership in saying we should be asking this and we, and, and we should get some answers. And you uh, will also play an incredibly important role as to whether this would actually happen uh, for the reasons mentioned here earlier. Um, and I think that you uh, could have a major role in deciding whether uh, these two districts consolidate reorganize or, uh, or, or shared services or whatever the future might be. Um, it, it, it will uh, and depend in a large part on uh, how our two, all of our firefighting units uh, work together. Uh, now would be a time for us to, uh, for, the La for our LAFCO Commission to do the one uh, action we have tonight, which is to accept this study. Uh, is there a motion? Second. Motion by Taraz and seconded by Friend. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, in order to, to make tonight happen, there are a lot of things that need to happen. Uh, there's, um, we are here at, at uh, Sampler Hall, uh, Cabrillo, uh, in part because of all of you. You all voted for a Cabrillo bond back in 2004 that allowed us to build this wonderful facility. So thank you very much for your foresight and leadership in uh, ensuring that we have facilities like this in our, in our community. I also want to recognize uh, two key uh, members of the Cabrillo uh, family that are, that are here tonight. Uh, one, the, the president of the college, Matthew Westing, is here. Welcome, Matthew. And long-serving uh, uh, member of the Board of Trustees, I had the pleasure of serving with him for eight years, Al Smith is here. He served for 24 years. Um, our consultants also did a great job, and I appreciate the presentation, uh, Don and Kurt, uh, and, and your colleague in Texas. Uh, we, you gave us a very thorough report, a lot to think about. Um, I'm sure there will be more uh, questions that come up, and we'll call on you to figure out why you said what you said, or why you gave us the information that you did. Uh, you all showed that you're leaders in the community by uh, taking time out of your busy schedule to be here tonight. So I want to thank the members of the public who are here and participating in this discussion. Uh, one more person from Cabrillo to thank is uh, Poco Marshall, who is the Performing Arts uh, uh, Complex Coordinator. He helps make sure that the lights turn on these microphone works. And this entire evening was filmed by Community TV. Uh, Victor Herman and Lynn Dutton have been doing a great job, and we'll look forward to seeing how well you did when we watch it on TV sometime soon. Uh, I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. I look forward to this con continued conversation and the leadership from all three of these organizations. Thank you and good night. <laughs>